This edition of Talk to Me is brought to you by Cobb County Freedom and Justice Fund, continuing the march to freedom and a call for justice on the local level in Cobb County, Georgia. Also, International Piano and Voice, Tomas Gerdiken. Learn online live with the German Prince of New Orleans Piano, Tomas Gerdiken. It's time once again for another edition of Talk To Me. And now, here's Emmy himself, eight-time Emmy Award-winning journalist, Maynard Eaton. Hello again, and welcome to this week's edition of Talk To Me, a weekly conversation with business leaders, political leaders, and cultural influencers. And today we have one of the city's best. Her name, Miss Elizabeth Omolami. She's the CEO of Hosea Feeds the Hungry. Let's take a look. Since 1971, Hosea Helps has been there for those in need. Whether people in the community are struggling to pay rent, looking to talk to someone they can trust, or longing for a healthy meal, clothing, or medical care, Hosea Helps has been here to lend a hand up. Today you can become part of that legacy. Your support can change a life, revitalize a family, and transform a community. Visit www.forhosea.org and donate your help today. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the CEO, Ms. Elizabeth Williams Omalami. Thank you for joining us, Elizabeth, and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for having me, and uh, I'm so honored to be uh, here with you because you know uh, Atlanta, you know my family, and it's just wonderful to be with someone that you know you don't have to convince about our mission. <laughs> No, not at all. You've you convinced much of the world, believe me. Tell us about Hosea Feeds the Hungry. This is the 50th anniversary of your annual Thanksgiving Day dinner, is it not? Absolutely, Maynard. Um, Jose Feed the Hungry is what I like to call it. It's like a boutique human service organization. It's it's okay. a, it's a small group of uh, 25 individuals that are full-time staff members, paid staff. And what we do is stabilize families and therefore we stabilize communities. Uh, we do that in with five key pillars. One is food security. So uh, there's a, a Maslow's triangle of human needs. And the first need, the basic need is food. And here in America, you would not believe how many people go hungry every day, or they are eating food that is working against them in their uh, desire to progress in the thrive in their lives. Uh, so we provide food for over 60,000 people a year. Wow. Rent assistance is, is very, very needed now ever since COVID. So, yeah. you know, we just received a $940,000 grant from the city uh, to do what we've been doing for the last six to 10 years, providing rent assistance for people who are being evicted or on the verge of being evicted. And we call that homeless prevention. Um, we also do that in the area of utilities and down payment assistance. We help people living in hotels uh, 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 provide case management for them and uh, financial assistance to help them get out of the hotel into transitional housing and then into permanent housing. And then the latest program that we've kicked off since COVID and we we have given out over a million dollars in food uh, since March. Uh, wow. Maynard, we have built capacity in smaller nonprofits so that we're duplicating ourselves in the community. And then they go out and do what we do in a smaller way, of course, but our outreach is almost quadrupled 
because we're duplicating ourselves, building capacity in smaller nonprofits to do what we do. So we embrace the community and meet the basic needs of the working poor and the homeless. And I've been, this is my 20, 20th year anniversary being uh, as uh -huh. CEO. 20 years ago when we lost uh, Hosea Williams' papa, Uncle Jose. <laughs> my man. Who started all this in 1970s. Elizabeth, how acute is the problem now? Seeing with COVID, this problem that you attack, homelessness and hunger, would seem to be overwhelming. I was on Auburn Avenue the other day, once the richest Negro street in America, now looks like a homeless shelter in and of itself, just Auburn Avenue. How acute, how tough a problem do you face? And over this past, is it worse now than it has been for the past 20 years? Well, I think that what happened with COVID is that it pulled the curtain back off uh, of those things that were already there, but were hidden. And it made those things uh, more extreme and much more devastating because a lot of the people that we serve were working as waitresses, were working in the hotel industry, were working at the baggage handlers with airlines, or were working with rent-a-car companies. And these are companies that laid off, shut down, didn't do well during uh, COVID. And so since March, we've seen, uh, I don't think, I think the unemployment must be at least at uh, 12 to 15% in the black and brown communities, uh, uh, BIPOC communities uh, around the country. I think that the, the issue of food insecurity is uh, much larger now because people are not able to get out. Many senior citizens especially are afraid to get out and do the yeah. kind of shopping that they need to do. And I'm very concerned also because many of the children uh, in the families that we serve do not have the technology required for at-home learning. And so many of them don't have parents that can help them with at-home learning, which is very, very challenging. I have three grandchildren that are, uh, are doing uh, at-home learning, and so I've seen it firsthand. So I think that all of these issues that are a result of poverty, which is a direct result of racial inequity, are exacerbated by COVID and have become much worse. In a sense, isn't your job part political? It seems like the problems you, you enunciate are really political problems that city officials have to deal with. Hunger, homelessness, and, and the plight of the poor. Uh, that's become your charge as well, has it not? Yes, everything is political. Um, and I think that uh, the funding that we receive uh, from individuals is our core source of funding because we cannot be dependent upon city grants or state grants or county grants. We don't want to be. That money is uh, can be pulled back as easily as right. it can be given. And you know, there's a lot of racism and sexism that exists in the philanthropic community when it comes to many of the foundations and many of the private uh, funding sources that don't see a Black run organization, especially run by a Black female, as viable. And uh, what they don't understand is that an organization like mine, Hosea Feed the Hungry and Homeless, can do more in the community at direct service-wise than many of the larger organizations that depend upon events and working with right. children when they were going to school. We get out there. We never did shut down. Uh, so yes, it is the responsibility of the mayor and the city and state officials, but also these foundations and funding sources get their tax dollars from a black tax base. And so they ought to be supporting black nonprofits. You know, I tell you, I've been around a while. You sound just like your dad there, your late father. I mean, he was a, a tough political pro who started Hosea Feeds the Hungry out of, he saw the need then. Um, 
is this something? Now you're an actress by trade. Did you follow your father's footsteps in, in doing this? Well, you know, you mentioned Auburn Avenue and, yes. and that's the, the Atlanta Tulsa was Auburn Avenue. It's just yeah. that it wasn't physically burned down, but integration kind of was the enemy of uh, the black businessman. And, and, and that's a whole different show. But I um, have learned uh, uh, he was the national field organizer for Martin Luther King. He was on Martin Luther King's staff and knew him directly. And I knew him directly. I learned that, uh, you know, you just have to have faith and walk by faith and not by sight. Because um, if you look in the bank account, you would want to shut it down. <laughs> but <laughs> you just keep going and God provides and, and, and you cannot uh, uh, disparage the spiritual aspect of what we do. And um, I think that it's critical now for us to meet the needs of the people because the pandemic has created isolation, loneliness, horrible, uh, horrible sense of, of, of being left out, of nobody caring, of being lost in these communities of color. So we have to be there now more than ever. And Hosea Williams was always the man in the community, walking the streets, shaking hands of people. And uh, he never let himself get separated from the people. You know, I. To me, I lament the fact that uh, your father, Reverend Hosea Williams, led that march across the Selma Bridge. He got beat. But rarely do we hear his name, we hear John Lewis's name. Does that ever bother you a little bit? That was your dad's march. Oh, sure. Yeah. It bothers me all the time, especially when the fact of the matter is that my father was the one that pulled this young man into the march, said, come on, stand up here with me. Right. Um, because he he really saw, you know, John was a, a, a prodigy in the civil rights movement. Being they were all very young, um, the, in their early twenties, mid twenties, early thirties, when when they went through this season of warfare, and but you know you can't let uh, we have to tell the stories. So I have to get out there and I have to tell people that my father led the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I have to tell people he was the first black chemist to be hired by the United States government. He was the first American in China once the Chinese American uh, embargo lifted. He was the um, uh, head of the uh, Resurrection City, the March on Washington, and he was pivotal in the um, passage of the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Bill, because he led the movements that led to the passage of those the pieces of legislation. So we have to tell our stories about our families or other people will take the stories and tell them the wrong way. He was also a political power broker, uh, former Atlanta City Councilman, state representative, what would he be saying now about the political climate? What's going on now, do you think? You know, he always got in trouble because he held the black <laughs> intelligentsia responsible That's for true. things that they should be doing that, they're, that they weren't doing. And so when we look at all the money in Atlanta and in other cities around the country, the entertainers and the the sports uh, uh, people making 15 million a year and you know that kind of money and yet you have hungry children. Why should that be so? Uh, how can the inequities, not just uh, racial inequity, but you look at the in economic inequity. So in our communities, you have a mixture of racism clashing with classism. And when those two things come together, people cannot survive. They cannot get better. And so they need the support of those that are have. So in every city, there's the haves and the have nots. And if the haves don't have a conscience 
or a sense of responsibility to make their communities better, then those communities do not thrive because they cannot depend on the government to do it. So he would be calling out people that have that kind of money saying, hey, what are you doing? Come, uh, you know, why are children hungry? Why are senior citizens, you know, these, are, we don't take care of our senior citizens as we should. As so they are suffering. They are afraid of medicine. They don't have food. They don't have toiletry items that they need. So he would be calling on that population, but he would also be saying, you know, Democrats, you take the black vote for granted. You think we should vote Democratic just because you're Democratic. But what are you going to do for us? And calling on Biden to come up with a strategic platform, a manifesto that lets us know what are his specific promises to the black community. Are there any elected officials out there now at all like your father, a fierce, uh, vocal, uh, dedicated leader? Anybody out there to remind you of your dad? I don't see anybody. <laughs> You know, those kinds of men and women have passed away. Yeah. Uh, we are now in an age where you think your friend is on Facebook. <laughs> you think that, you know, you get so many likes, a million likes, and you're a, a celebrity on Facebook. So that makes you, gives you the ability to speak politically for people. Um, these are all very, very false values. But I see people like uh, Mabel, Abel Mabel, you know, yeah. she stays. The way I judge someone is if you are too big to do the little things, you are too little to do the big things. So if I don't see you out there in the community, you're not having food, feeding people. You're not um, uh, passing legislation that favors tenants over landlords because these landlords and developers are crushing on the backs of renters and 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 home buyers if i don't see you uh assisting in some school with some children doing something then what are you in elected office for so these are the means that i use to judge a person's um connection to the priorities that the civil rights movement left for us, which are still our priorities. Uh, equal opportunity in housing, we uh, affordable housing, um, e e equity in employment so that men don't get paid more than women. Um, educational equity so that our schools that are in black communities aren't uh, you know, lacking in technology, et cetera. Those issues are the same issues that we have today. And I think that when Martin Luther King was murdered, he was getting ready to go into more of an economic uh, phase, uh, focus, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and he was getting ready to bond perhaps with African countries or people around the world to bring the brown uh, people up economically and that's one of the reasons he was murdered along with his uh other uh initiatives about vietnam and war etc so um we see young people out there in politics but you know a lot of times they don't listen to the elders so so they make mistakes and they don't do as well as they could because there's this divide between the past and the present. We just had a, a special election uh, for the fifth district seat. Uh, and none of the issues you mentioned were articulated except perhaps by Abel Mabel Thomas. I, I didn't hear them at all. And a woman who's been given the seat, uh, unfairly in my opinion, Nakima Williams, doesn't talk about anything at all. So in the most current race affecting the black community, the fourth ward, the fifth district, you've not heard any of the issues you just articulated. 
Exactly. And and I think it's I think it's sad that John Lewis was unable to pass on yeah. his spirit to someone that maybe he would say this is the person I think we should go with. But he chose not to do that. And I, I can't question that. But we don't know how to do succession planning sometimes <laughs> in our community. You know, we just we just don't know how to pass on. Right now, Jose Fee has served black brown people since 1970. You know, I'm thinking, well, I may pass this on to my son. Well, that right. is some kind of a thing uh, to do. Because <laughs> young people, you know, they don't think you know anything. <laughs> and it's uh, it's very difficult to pass it on. But I think that's why even the marchers weren't as successful as right. they could have been. Because I would like to have met with some of those young people that were planning those marches and say, where's your manifesto? Where's your list of demands? Who are you marching against? Why are you marching on the governor's house and he's not even home? That's a waste of energy. But I guess it might be, I've never been 68 before. So <laughs> maybe it's an age old problem that passing on knowledge and information to the youth is always an issue. But I would say if there are any young people that are listening to this show, find, you know, you have people that are passing away left and right. You could have been sitting at their feet, sucking up all that information, but before they left here. We just lost Dr. Barbara King. You know, she's someone that I really looked up to. So how do we bridge the gap? so we cannot go around the mountain for 40 years. You know, I'm 70 and we were in college together at Hampton, but we listened, our generation I think listened. Maybe we didn't act as well, but we learned in Hampton and learned here in Atlanta. Uh, but I do think there's been a disconnect between our generation and the ones behind us. And that's terrible. That's the worst thing that could ever happen to us because, you know, uh, we don't want our young people to think that economic wealth or wealth and well-being means success. Sure. It's better to be rich than poor. And you can't help the poor if you are poor. Dick Gregory told me that. <laughs> but <laughs> he said, you can't help poor people if you poor. Well, I never really learned that much about financial, handling finances for myself. So I'm not a wealthy woman. But I do think that the work that I do, pouring into other human beings and lifting them from a state of de depression uh, is part of what means to be, what it means to be successful. It's true. And so I just don't want our young people to latch on to this American, um, you know, way of living that is primarily oriented towards yourself, oriented towards making money and getting all you can get for yourself and to think that's success because that is not success. Success really lies in what you do for others, how you educate others like you're doing, Maynard, how you care for others, you know, what you, how you volunteer, because that's the only thing that's gonna last. The reason we're still sitting here talking about Hosea Williams over, you know, two, he died in 2000 is because wow. he gave, poured his life into other people. That's true. And that's what creates a legacy. That's true. Speaking of someone else with a legacy, you mentioned her name, Bishop Dr. Barbara King, one of the first black women in the pulpit and to have her own church. Uh, she meant a lot to you, did she not? You wrote a, a, a a really heart-wrenching uh, memoir or condolences a letter about her. Tell us about your relationship with Bar Barbara King, please, the late Dr. Barbara King. Yes, I. that is one of the people that I should have been sitting at her feet much more than I was, and now she's gone. Dr. Barbara King 
broke the barriers in the black church for women yeah. to preach. They told her women don't preach in this denomination or women don't stand in the pulpit in this denomination or, you know, the patriarchal version that we get of Christianity, which doesn't include the divine feminine. She laid that out before these preachers and these bishops and these denominations to say, how could you have a God that is a creator have a female aspect when life into the world? So to me, she was, uh, she, she got, she took the hits so we could stand in the pulpit today. You know, there's, there is no progress without pain. Always somebody's blood has to be shed. I don't know why that's so, Maynard, but yes. that is the truth. My dad's job was to go around the country and get beat him and his staff, and then they would get beat and their blood would be shed. Then Martin Luther King would call in the smooth talkers like Andy Young <laughs> and Bernard Lafayette and say, now you go to the town and you tell them, if they don't give us what we want, we're gonna let Jose and his boys tear up this town. <laughs> well, Barbara King in the same way, she took the, 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 the hits and the blows and, and people talking about her. She was over six feet tall yeah right and she was just so powerful and what she left me with though was seeking never stop seeking never stop learning the whole her whole uh concept of god in us is i'm seeking to understand and to realize what she meant not God not being out there somewhere, but right in here. The spiritual power that we have, that we don't know we have, and we don't know how to wield it. So we end up in warfare without our weapons. Uh. And so we wonder why we're so tired and we're so depressed and we feel beat down, even though we have money in the bank. There are people with money in the bank that are more depressed than the poor people I saw when I was feeding people in Haiti. Mm. So, so the weapons of our warfare are not physical, but they are spiritual. And she left me at least with enough of an unction about that reality for me to know that I need to keep seeking, keep praying, and and be more of a spiritual being. Finally, uh, Elizabeth, both you and your husband are not only work with Hosea Feeds the Hungry, but both of you are accomplished actors, starred in films. You've been, you know, you've done so much on, on stage and screen. Uh, but you told me this week that I, after our show last week with uh, uh, Camille Love, uh, the head of cultural affairs in Atlanta, that you had a, uh, it hurts you. Your your reaction, your interaction with her was something painful for you. Could you share a little bit of that with us? Sure, you, you're trying to get me in trouble, but I'm gonna <laughs> tell this story. Um, I felt that I needed to do a one woman show because when I took over Jose Feed the Hungry and Homeless, I had to give up a lot of my acting career. Right. Because, you know, you can't do too many things at once. And then the older you get, you can do fewer things at, at the same time. And oh, then well, they did some research that said, yeah, multitasking is just not a good idea. So I wanted to spend some time writing. I wanted to write about being the first woman in the Forsyth County Jail to spend the night during that movement. I, I wanted to write about being sent to an all-white high school in Utah in the 60s so we could integrate that school and people rubbing my skin to see if the black would rub off. I wanted to write about sitting on Martin Luther King's lap and him smiling in my face. I wanted to write about the pain of losing a father to the movement 
and 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 what that meant. So I went to Camille and I said, you know, I would like to do a one woman show. I'm an accomplished actress. She knows that. And she told me, well, tuh, you need to go talk to Kenny Leon. And I was just shocked and amazed at her how she handled me. You know, yeah. I am not the kind of person that thinks I'm a celebrity. Uh, I try to stay humble as possible, but rude is just rude. <laughs> and some people would call us civil rights. So would you need King that, you know, would you talk to uh, uh, Donzele Abernathy, who's also an actress that way? Um, so sometimes we get so high and so holy that we're no earthly good. <laughs> That's why you have to stay connected to the streets. You have to stay connected to the people who are struggling to make a living every day so that you will know that you are just like them. You are no better than them and they are no better than you, but they will keep you grounded. They will keep you centered. They will keep you uh, not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought. They will put you in your place when you start getting high and mighty. So I love being with the homeless people. I love being in those communities and those apartments with those women that we that we serve at Jose Feed the Hungry. I love holding those children with the dirty diapers and the mamas don't have money for diapers and don't have money for food. These are the people that I embrace because they let me be my authentic self with them. They don't judge me and they would never treat me like I've been treated by people with authority and position. Um, and so I will do the show. I will eventually do it. You know, I'm not going to give up on it. But you have to be careful what you say to people, Maynard. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. can you can crush somebody's dream by telling them the wrong thing in a moment when they're open to you. So you just have words can't be taken back. So that's that. <laughs> well, we thank you for all you do and who you are. We thank you for your authentic self. Really, you are uh, you are your father's daughter, and we thank God for him, and we applaud you. Elizabeth, oh, I William, bless you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank yes, you so and much. I want everybody to 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 go to our website at number four hosea.org. I'm also live on Facebook page every Friday at six, talking about things like the murder of young Sequoia Turner, eight years old. Nobody ever found here in the, the city her murderers. So please stay in touch with me. And you are somebody that I'm waiting for your book. <laughs> yeah, I'm writing it. I'm writing it. Why? Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. See you next week, everybody. This has been Talk to Me.